Okay, today we're going to be talking about food chains and biodiversity. So, gather a pen, that'll do. Okay, so this is a food chain. A food chain follows a single line of energy through from where it's produced all the way to where it finally ends up. So the first part of our food chain is a producer. And this is always some kind of plant. The next um, part of our food chain will always be a herbivore or an omnivore. eating plants, and this will be our primary consumer. This goes on. Here we have our secondary consumer. Which is a carnivore. And our final consumer is also a carnivore However, here it will be called a top carnivore or a top predator. And in this case, this is our tertiary consumer, but we can go all the way up to quaternary consumer and so forth. So that is a food chain. The arrows in a food chain shows what's happening to the energy. So here the plant produces the energy the mouse then eats the plant, so the energy moves from the plant to the mouse. Then the snake eats the mouse, so the energy moves from the mouse to the snake. So the arrows show the flow of energy in our, um, in our food chain. Okay, so <clears throat> next we get a food web. So a food web, as you can see over here, is a bit of a rather interconnected mess of food chains. We've got plants down here, and then we can follow the individual food chains. So the plants could be eaten by a rat, which could be eaten by a ringtail, which could be eaten by a wolf. Or we can follow it to a nut house, nut hatch, a whiptail, to a cat, or there's various different ways. So food webs are interconnected food chains. Okay, so the last thing that we have happen in a food web or a food chain is when our top predator or anywhere else in our food chain dies, then the energy gets taken to a decomposer. So a decomposer is an organism that um, essentially helps what is there to rot and to turn back into base nutrients for plants to then use to make energy. So decomposers could be things like um, insects, like maggots. It could be bacteria. It could be mushrooms or fungus. So the last step is a, um, some kind of decomposer. Um, okay, if you guys want the food web picture, um, I will send it to you guys, but I'm not entirely sure how I will manage that, but I will figure something out. Um, so yeah, anyway, so here we've got a food web. So now, the next part is the different kinds of factors that influence the amount of creatures that we have in a system. So our environmental factors could be abiotic factors, so that A means non-biotic. So an antibiotic, abiotic, please make that connection. So this is non-biotic factors. This could be things like the temperature, The rainfall. Um, it could be wind. Uh, it could be minerals in the soil. Whoop. 
it could be chemicals that have been introduced to the environment. Um, it could be fire, it could be sunlight. So all of these are abiotic factors that can influence the, how many um, things we have in this environment. Okay, biotic factors are the living things factors in an environment. So biotic factors could be the amount of food or the amount of predators. Those are in general our biotic factors. Um, the last one here could be some kind of disease. It's also a biotic factor. Okay. A change in one of these factors will cause a change in the number of animals and plants in the whole environment. So if we go back up to our picture over here, say this was near a farm and the um, farmer used some kind of pesticide in order to get rid of the insects that are busy eating his plants, which means that over here, we no longer have butterflies. The butterflies have died out due to some kind of pesticide. So now we've got a bunch of things busy happening. So the butterflies were eaten by the whiptails, the eagles, and the jackrabbits. They will now have less food to eat. So there is eventually going to be less whiptails, eagles, and jackrabbits because they don't have quite so much food to eat. So hungrier, that makes sense, right? So we can also go down the other route. So that was going upwards. If we go upwards, we can have less eagles, jackrabbits, whiptails. We can eventually, because these are going to be less, have less wolves, lions, and cats, because that is what eagles and or uh, jackrabbits and whiptails are eaten by. Um, we can also go down to look at what the implication is of no more butterflies going this way. So here, if there's no more butterflies, there will be more plants because there's no butterflies to eat the plants. If there's more plants, then we can get more rats, more nuthatches, more frogs, more squirrels, more deer. So these are gonna increase. If these increase in numbers, then all of our predators over here, their numbers can also start increasing again. Um, so, it's, it's a bit of a balance that needs to be kept in environments. So if we have one disturbance in an environment, we can end up getting a big change happening throughout all of the species in an environment due to this one change. So biodiversity, the definition of biodiversity is the amount of species we can find in a single place. Okay, if you have a high biodiversity, that means that there are lots of different species. Okay, if you have a low biodiversity, that means that you don't have a lot of species. A low biodiversity could be something like what happens at the North or the South Pole. You get penguins and some polar bears, um, maybe a whale or two, that's about it. You don't get plants or other things. You get some fish under the water, but that's an area of very low biodiversity. Whereas if you look at the Amazonian rainforest, that's an area of very, very high biodiversity. If you just look at one small bit of the animal, uh, Amazonian rainforest, you can get tons of insects, lots of different kinds of plants, um, lots of different kinds of animals, big animals, small animals, tiny little red-eyed tree frogs, much bigger things. You can even get those huge anacondas all sorts of things. So the Amazonian rainforest has a very, very high biodiversity. The, the South Pole has an extremely low biodiversity. Most places are somewhere in the middle. So a greater biodiversity 
is a greater survivability for all of the animals in such an environment. So if we look over here, from a change in the amount of butterflies, we saw changes in all of these kinds of species. However, if we were in an area that has a very low biodiversity, say in this area there are two kinds of antelope, uh, roibokis and springboks, and um, we have some lions and we have some grass, and that is the entire area. Then if something happens to one of these creatures, say there is a specific kind of disease that now goes in and attacks the springbok in the environment, then it has a much bigger repercussion throughout this smaller system because there's less things in it. Due to the fact that there are less springbok, the lions are going to start starving, they're going to start dying because there are less lions, the roibokis are going to start increasing immensely in, in um, numbers. So eventually you're going to have an area that gets absolutely decimated because you've got so many roibokis that they're eating all of the grass and things and you end up with a desert eventually. There's nothing growing there. All of the roibokis start dying off because there's no more food because they ate all of it. You get big repercussions due to the fact that that has a small biodiversity. If you have a large biodiversity, this over here was a fairly big biodiversity, not really, but if you get a big biodiversity, then you end up having a greater, num a greater chance of everything else in the environment surviving if something happens to one of the species. Okay. Or a great bio, greater biodiversity, if something happens in the environment, say a fire goes through the forest, um, due to the fact that you've got a greater biodiversity, there is a much greater chance that the species has survived this big fire happening. Okay. So now I want to move on to the kinds of questions that you could expect about food chains and biodiversities. So I've got um, a bunch of questions that I've taken from past papers. I'm not gonna do whole past papers with you guys. It is not needed um, due to the fact that you guys ha don't have all of the um, knowledge gained yet. You still have one and a half books to go after foundation one in foundation two. So that's when I start going through past papers really with you here we're going to do specific questions. So this is from the, the 2014 specimen paper one. This is question one. It, the giant panda lives in China. This diagram shows a simple food web involving the panda. So we have water plants which get eaten by snails, which get eaten by fish. The giant panda catches some fish. We also have some bamboo plants which gets eaten by the giant panda. This is an example of a fairly low biodiversity area. So <clears throat> name one producer in the food web. So producers are always plants. We've got two of them. We've got water plants and bamboo. So you can write the name of any one of them. So name one primary consumer. So a primary consumer is something that only eats plants or it could be the giant panda that eats the bamboo. So in this case, I'm gonna go with snails because if you look at the giant panda, it could be a primary consumer on this side or a primary, secondary, tertiary consumer on this side. So safe bets, I'm rather gonna go with um, snails. Okay, um, use the information in the food web to explain why the panda is described as an omnivore. So an omnivore eats both plants and animals. And animals, the panda. It's fish and bamboo. There we go. 
What do the arrows in the food web show? They show the transfer of energy. Was a horrible one. Okay. Question E says many of the bamboo forests in China are being cut down. This is causing the panda population to decrease. Suggest why? So there's two different reasons that we can give here. The first is they've got less food. So less food means that the pandas are starving, so we end up with less pandas. Our second reason here could be because the forests are being cut down, they have less shelter, which also means that we end up with less pandas. Okay. So this question has nothing to do with the specific piece of work, so I'm going to skip that one. So now we get to April and May this year, paper two. There's two questions from this year about this section of work. So a group of bird watchers collect data to show how the numbers of farmland birds change over time. So here we've got the um, number of birds and this is the year and they used some observations. So the data for each year was obtained from a large number of observations. Explain why it's a good idea to make a large number of observations. So it gives you more accurate data. Please answer your questions in full sentences, however. It just takes quite a while if I have to do it here. So the results shown in the graph are estimates explain why it is not possible to find an exact number of farmland birds. You simply cannot catch all of the birds in the world, go count them and then set them free. It's not possible. So, The bird watchers measured the change in number of farmland birds, write down two factors that affect the number of farmland birds. So this could be any of those biotic or abiotic factors that we have listed earlier. So it could be the amount of food, the number of predators, It could be disease, could be the amount of shelter we've got, it could be um, pesticides, any of these could contribute so you could just name two factors that you know they will pretty much be accepted. So here we've got again the same paper, this is question 10. So here we've got a, um, a food, food web. We've got grass. The grass gets eaten by mice, rabbit, and grasshoppers. The mice and the grasshoppers get eaten by snakes and lizards. And then everything gets eaten by the hawk, pretty much. So explain what is shown by the arrows in the food web. I already answered this in the previous section. So that is the transfer of energy from one organism to another. So name three primary consumers. The primary consumers are the ones that eat the plants. So we've got mice, rabbit, and grasshoppers. So mouse, rabbit, grasshoppers. Okay, why is it difficult to classify the hawk as a secondary consumer? So if we look at the hawk over here, you can see that here in this line, he is a secondary consumer because the rabbit is the primary consumer, so the hawk's the secondary. But if we look at this line over here, we go from the grass to the mouse, primary consumer, to the snake, secondary consumer. The hawk is a tertiary consumer. So we could literally just go right down that counterexample. So here we go. 
the hawk could be a tertiary consumer in the food chain grass mouse snake hawk there we go so name an organism that competes with the lizard for food so the lizard eats grasshoppers so lizard eats grasshoppers what else eats grasshoppers the hawk so the hawk competes with the lizard So the rabbits are all killed off by a disease. What effect does this have on the number of mice? Give a reason for your answer. Okay, so let's go look over here. We have no more rabbits. So we can follow two parts here. If we have no more rabbits, the hawk has less food. So there will be less hawks. If there's less hawks, there could be more mice. Okay. Um, we could uh, essentially go another route from the same thing. We have no more rabbits. The hawk now needs to find food elsewhere, so the hawk is going to eat more mice. So there will be less mice. So whether we have more mice or less mice, that answer doesn't, isn't where you're getting your marks. You're getting your marks from the reason that you give. We could also go this way. Um, the rabbit doesn't eat the grass anymore. There's more grass, so there's more food for the mice to eat, so there will be more mice. So we can go any route there as long as we justify it well. So <clears throat> let's go with less mice because our reason is um, There are no more rabbits. So the hawks will eat more mice. We could also go there will be more mice because the food increased due to there not being rabbits also eating the food. We could be more mice because there's no more rabbits, so the, the um, hawks will die off, which means that there will be more mice. So you could give any reason, as long as you justify it well, you will get your marks. Okay, I'm gonna answer this last question, and then I'm going to answer the questions you guys put in the chat. So this is from April, May, 2012, paper two. Um, there's lots more papers with these questions. I just picked a few of them. Um, especially ones that show different kinds of questions that they ask. They ask the same kinds of questions in lots of the papers. Like what does the arrow show? They asked it in two of these questions. So using the letter A or B, say which organism is the predator and which organism is the prey. So the predator is this one over here and the prey is what it's eating. So that would be number B. So here we have a diagram of parts of a food web in an oak wood. Name the producer in this food web. That would be our oak tree. That's the only plant that we have in this whole food web. Write down a complete food chain from the web with exactly four organisms in it. Okay, so exactly four. We need to start over here. So that is one, two, three, okay. One, two, th one, two, three, four. There's one, two, three, four. This way going is one, two, one, two, three, four, five. So as long as you write down one that has exactly four, that's fine. So there's two of them. Oak tree to moth larva. And then we can go either to uh, the blackbird or to the blue tit. And these can both be eaten by the hawk.
Okay. From what source does the oak tree obtain its energy? And that would be from sunlight. It is a producer, so it uses the sunlight to make its own food, essentially. 